And what I needed for a film like this was, you know, some level area that you could swing a cat in with flat areas and places where you could build sets. And so Mel went to Mexico, and I didn't go with him. And uh, he went to see this jungle there that had been told about by Anna Roth, who is the production manager on the film. It was basically jungle. They wanted jungle, and the fact that it was Mayan made it logical to, to be sort of like put together in Mexico. There. Bang, 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 bang. And so he went to see this piece of jungle, and he called me, and he said, dude, I found it, I found the jungle. And I said, wow, cool, what, what's it like? And he goes, it's, it's beautiful. Action! It's flat, so we can do all the chase stuff we want to do. We can have our actors run through it. Cool. That was great. But the best thing about it is you can see deep, deep, deep into this jungle. And it's got these huge trees, and they really create the scenes. I mean, they really add to the atmosphere. There's a serenity to it. In Mexico, we were able to find some primary rainforest, uh, some really impressive stuff. I mean, as you saw, these trees are amazing. Whoa, go, 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 go. That was beautiful. So we chose Catimaco, the village that was uh, near this piece of jungle, as our base for the next uh, five, six months. But you're out there for those two exchanges. I want to see you smiling and enjoying it, laughing. OK. Hey. Action. We started with a small group in the jungle where the requirements were not so big. We had a normal crew. And then as we approached the city in order to fulfill the needs of the visual concept, as far as wardrobe, makeup, hair, it just became big, big, big. We're talking 700 extras. 700 extras is not such an outstanding figure, but the visual concept is so complicated that each one of these extras has a makeup person and a hair person and, and a wardrobe person. And if you multiply it by 700, that is a lot of people. I suggested to Tom Sanders, what about doing the city? in a bigger place, some place where I could house all the people that were required. So we then moved to Veracruz, where we had built the city set. And the camera's going past and you just go. <laughs> There's a tremendous effort being made for it to be real. Of course, some people say, well, you could do it all in CG, or you could do it all in models, you know. Um, but really, Mel said, well, you know, I need to have a city there. I need to see something. And he can turn from side to side and, you know, and it can kind of more or less control. Well, it had to be practical. And you had to be able to walk people through it and march them upstairs and, and look at them from down the bottom and have things roll down. And so uh, there was a lot of work required for that. It took a long time. And Tom Sanders, a uh, production designer who'd worked with Mel before uh, on Braveheart, came on very early on and decided to build this city for us. Something that will never be seen in film again, that you may have seen way back in the great Cecil B. DeMille epics, or, or Cleopatra, or like uh, Ben-Hur, or whatever it may be, where the actual Mayan city that we are shooting in was mostly constructed right there before our very eyes. the huge pyramid temples and the marketplace. When you actually see that marketplace sequence, you'll almost, I think, be able to smell it off the screen. It looks so real. I mean, it's like a time machine here. These elements, the shanty town, the terraced fields that you'll see in the lime quarry and the tree fall. Action! Everything that you will see in this film were actual real elements that we shot. The main, main components of the city were designed and built there for us on set and maintained for months like that.
<laughs> Frank on drums. <laughs> the real sets were the way to go, and the people there had a real sense that they were in a place. I mean, it was awesome to walk in there, even empty. Um, you know, you'd walk in there and you'd go, woo. I remember when we shot the village scene where the storyteller's telling a story. I remember that that was the first time during the shoot when everybody involved in the film came to the set. Okay, guys, start clearing the quiet all around. Silencio, por favor, we're ready to shoot. All camera set, guys. And the storyteller's telling a story. And then when he finishes, this music starts to happen. slowly get up and dance. And then you see Mel in the middle, conducting it. Okay, now you slowly rise. Now tell, start to dance. Now you guys stand up and now you move. And I just remember everybody crowded around the monitor, staring at the scene. That was a big opportunity and a big responsibility. You just see these images or, or a way of looking at something that's kind of exciting. It's kind of a magic thing. It's so vivid, um, so defined, so beautiful. We have ceramics and sculpture and monuments that give us an idea of what the Maya were doing, how they were dressed, the types of jade ornaments they were wearing, tattooing and scarification on their faces, on their bodies. It was a method of display. There was a lot of elegance, even the way they chose to see themselves. You're showing yourselves off, you want to be seen. Very elegant, very stylized. The Mayans had many styles of beauty. Looking good for the others was an obligation. For her? Yeah. There is actually a lot of information on how the Mayans wore their empire. The challenging thing was how to interpret all this.
to set all the different tones that we wanted to use. We made samples of all these colors from natural vegetables and animals that the Mayans used. For example, this beautiful red sienna comes from rojo cochinilla, and it gives you a variety of degrees of this kind of red. We also used indigo blue. So many hues in one single feather and we actually were able to recreate a green that comes from bladder of animals. We're making costumes that nobody ever done. The prints that you see have to be recreated because they did it freehand. We did about 50 different designs, patterns and embroidery that they have from those times. Every single thing that you see in this movie is hand sewn handmade, you can't get any shortcuts because we shoot in five cameras all the time. It has to be perfect. The Mayans used a lot of jade. It was a symbol of wealth and happiness and trade and trust. <laughs> But for logistic reasons, we couldn't have all this made out of jade. So we have to learn how to paint all these light materials into jade, just hand painting them. All these bits are wood, and uh, we have to make it look like if it was jade. And it looks beautiful, just like jade. The Mayas viewed status through the use of jade, exotic commodities like shell and mother of pearl. One of the most obvious things was the use of jade ear spools. So it would perforate the earlobe, a small piece of jade in, and then gradually expand that until it was able to accommodate a large ornament. The things that are very, very original in this film stem from the fact that Mel, as an artist and as a filmmaker, is at a place where he can take those chances. Some of the things that you will see in this film, you will never have seen before. The costume that I wear is so mythic. It belongs in every culture of a warrior society. But as soon as I put all of that leather armor on, I completely just, you know, become this character. It's like, oh my God, what is this? Is this an animal or a man? There's no work required other than to wear the costume. Raul, signal those guys to move out. It's like Mel says, you don't have to be scary. You are scary. And try to look just straight out with your face. I mean, it is so, that's ominous. This is not a normal movie. It is a big makeup and hair movie. Te puede maquillar así, por ejemplo. Sí. Por la noche. Sí. Te gustaría. Sí. My department is quite big. Probably it's the biggest I have had in my life, like 250 people. Details are so important. Even though you don't see it, you feel it. This has really been a big challenge. I start to see every single drawing. What they used to have for ears and earrings, for nose bridges, for tattoos, and everything which is makeup. Our first thinking was, uh, how can we make the public understand who they are? Everything they used to do in, uh, in their life was for the gods. In fact, every single tattoo is a sign of uh, a religion. They had a concept of afterlife and a concept of life as it related to afterlife. The behavior that they'd exhibit because of that, you know. They had a concept of paradise and damnation and 
and sin. <laughs> Village people, I mean, people that lives with nothing. We've been very minimal with tattoos and things. Okay, cut. With the middle class, I went a little more tattoos, more air tattoos. We also get rich people and high class people. But then when you put all together, you see this difference between. Each person looks different. You've got these beautiful ladies with the jade teeth who are like using their fans and laughing and smiling. And you can tell that there's something different about them. Maybe you say something to her and you laugh. The material we use for the earlobes is silicon because the earlobes are stretched. I could not use something hard. I need to have uh, movement. <laughs> Another very important thing was the Mayan profile. The real Mayans uh, have uh, curl nose. It is a particular Mayan nose, the original Mayan look. That's great. That was one of the first questions. Do you mind wearing a prosthetic nose? All the makeup, the scarifications, the tattoos, the various piercings that were applied to the actors every single day. Morning after morning, these, these busloads of extras would come in, and there were rows and rows of makeup chairs with, with mirrors and little red lights above them. Every time a new makeup chair would become clear, then the red light would come on. There was an AD person going, OK, you, go there. On the biggest days, we had 200 and some odd makeup artists working on hundreds and hundreds of extras. Action! You see them all together. To give the richest one to the poorest one is made up with tattoos, with scarification. Yeah, that's it, that's it, Rudy, stay like that. All of them had to be different because we know the way the Mel shoots. He close-ups on every single extra, and they are marvelous. Don't hit him hard with it, you know, I mean, still miss him, but you can at least make a little contact. Kind of, okay. There was something very exciting in terms of being able to come up with weapons that people had never seen before. Simon Atherton is a world-class armorer. Every film you've ever seen that you think the weapons in it are cool, Simon Atherton probably supplied the weapons. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's amazing. That's <laughs> He's a favorite of mine, particularly when it comes to primitive weaponry. So you were going for Fish Hunter, right? And Rudy got by you. It's like pig and farmer, you know? So you're chasing him back. I have worked with Noel before. I worked with him on Braveheart. It was one of the first big feature films I ever did. He doesn't just limit his activity to, you know, being the armor or the weapons guy or the designer. He, he's really creative with some of these things. For example, a frog and some blow darts. He says, what's this? And he had this little dart that he made, you know, with some Q-tips and a, you know, straight pin. And he just grabs a piece of paper and rolls it up and goes, Pff! and it just whap. And he says, what if he uses a leaf? <laughs> There's whimsy in it. He came to this film really wanting to strike that perfect balance between historical accuracy and things that just looked cool. First of all, you've got to figure out what tools they've got and what materials they've got. From that, you can figure out what kind of weapons they'd have. We knew that the Mayans didn't have any metal. What they used was obsidian, which is a very hard, very sharp kind of glass mineral that would cut through anything. The edge on it is just horrific. And then that made a fantastic sword. This is an obsidian sword. Not many of these things have survived. And then this would be a very sharp cutting edge. It's got blades, obsidian yeah. blades on it. Yeah. These things were studded with obsidian and could inflict some serious damage. And it was brutal. It was amazing. It was glass is going to shatter, but it doesn't. They also used that kind of material for their sacrificial knives. They could cut and slash, get inside a man's ribcage within seconds. And if you imagine that's the last thing that you see as it's coming towards you. 
In this film, people aren't attacking only, they, they're going out to take prisoners. So we had to invent weapons that not only killed people, but stunned people. So you'll see some of the weapons don't have obsidian on both sides, like this sword. They will have it on one side. And that would be to inflict a stunning blow rather than a killing blow. These are the weapons and techniques that the Mayans had. It was absolutely accurate historically. Here they were being seen for the first time on film. As you look at the quantity and the extent and the caliber of the artistic merit that the Maya had, it reads a sense of respect, a sense of awe, and a sense of understanding. From the moment the film starts to the moment it ends, you feel like you're transported into this world that you are seeing very much primarily through visual means of communication. And what ends up happening is that you buy it more. You really believe these people. You think that those are the actual Mayans and we just took a camera and happened to shoot this fantastic action story in the real world. To pull all these things together into a film with huge moving parts is amazing to watch. That's what filmmaking is about. That it was a very exciting thing to look at, that it looked dynamic, that it was odd. Something so strange to look at, what people thought of as beautiful or what they wished to adorn. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, one started off with that, boy, why would they think of that? But by the time you were finished looking at them, they were beautiful. I mean, it was just like, okay, I know why they did that. It had this aesthetic that began to appeal to me. And it looks beautiful on film. And it fills you with wonder.